I think we're gonna, gonna try and get started. My daughter is trying to learn to play the piano over there. <laughs> Look, it's Keisha. <laughs> She's adorable, absolutely adorable. Me or your daughter? Well, you too, brother. <laughs> Hi, baby. You want to join me? Oh, I love you. <laughs> She's going to steal the show, you know. <laughs> well, we're on our last message, and I've saved the best wine to last, so I trust the Lord will will bless us in this last session. Thank you for enduring along with the teaching today and uh, this conference. We pray will be something the Lord uses to encourage our hearts. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the invitation to come and to share the Word of God. And uh, we hope by the Lord's grace we'll see each other again. But as Lawrence was saying, our plan in the Lord's will is to uh, we'll be in Kelowna after this. We've got to bring Keisha to a dentist appointment on Tuesday morning, so we have to head out tonight to get there. Um, we're going to be going up to Edmonton to visit family, and then we'll go down to the island, Vancouver Island, to visit my uh, my sister. We'll, that's her car we're using. She was very gracious to let us use her car. And then uh, after we visit around Christmas time with family, then we'll make our way back to Ghana. In the will of the Lord. We might be in heaven long before that, but who knows? With all these bombs flying over Israel, we just wonder what's happening in the Lord's prophetic calendar. So let's just say a little prayer and ask God's blessing as we finish off our lesson today. Kisha, Daddy's going to pray, okay? Daddy's going to pray. Oh, well, let's, let's hope she doesn't hit the keys. <laughs> And now we're going to have a musical number. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this last meeting of our day. Uh, we thank you again for your word and pray that we'd have attentive hearts and minds to this final message you have for us. And we pray for our families. Father, families gather at this time to, uh, to offer up thanksgiving. Some of them don't know you. Some of them may not even show much thanksgiving. But we pray this season, this Day we call Thanksgiving. We'll indeed, redound to your glory as people lift up their hearts in gratitude for all the goodness. We know that everything we have comes from you, and we're so grateful. We thank you for our families and ask all of our families to be blessed today as we celebrate this special day in the calendar. Now, as we look at the final message, please guide us through the Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, the last message, the assembly, there are many things that could be said about the assembly, but one of them, and one of the most important things, is the assembly is an altar, that is a place of worship, a place to gather and think of God and remember Him. Now, um, we are to be worshipers, we are to be people who come into the presence of God. The thing which Christ has afforded to us is a relationship to the Father, a relationship with God, and we are invited into the holy place. The tabernacle had a lot to teach us, and we'll go through a little bit of that today uh, as we finish this message off. 
The tabernacle is a great teaching tool, a good vivid illustration of the gospel and what God has done to give us access right into his presence. And we need to understand what it means to have an altar, a place where we can make our offerings to God. Sometimes I think we fail maybe in this area to appreciate what has been afforded to us, the privilege that is given to us to come into the presence of God and worship him. A lot of people who don't know the Lord would really fail to understand the glory and the privilege that is ours as believers to enter the very presence of God and be welcome there. When we talk about offerings, that's what we do on an altar. We make offerings. Offerings come from uh, a word that means to uh, draw near to the one you love, a gift. At Christmas time, we give one another gifts. We give gifts because we love the person. And it's a sense of being joined together. It's not that, oh, you need this new microwave, so I'm going to buy you a microwave because you need one. Some people treat Christmas that way. It's like all about need and not about just expressing love. I care about I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you. And that word that we comes from the Hebrew that really has this idea of drawing near and drawing close to. And this is what God wants. He doesn't need whatever we give him. Everything we give to God, he's given to us, right? But he wants us to draw near. Isn't that what Hebrew says? Draw near with a full uh, heart, uh, a full assurance of faith. We're to draw near. God wants us near. We saw that in our message, Family Bible Hour, that Jesus wants to draw near to us. And so the offering, and this picture I think beautifully demonstrates the sentiment or what, what worship is. The little girl is on her daddy's back and she's kissing him on the cheek, giving him a card. What is she saying? She's saying, Daddy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. That's what worship is. Worship is admiration of the one who's done so much for you, who you admire, who you uh, just look up to, because everything comes from their hand. Everything, blessing comes from them, and we want to worship them. And so God has provided in the Old Testament uh, many offerings. And I think when we look at these offerings, we learn something about what offerings mean. A lot of it has to do with our access to the Father our access to God, getting into the presence of God, what allows us to be there. And of course, the one thing that we offer to God that is acceptable by him is his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the acceptable offering. Everything in those Levitical offerings, uh, we find in Leviticus chapter 1 to 7, the Levitical offerings, all of that speaks of the Lord Jesus. Everything, every detail gives us some specific truth about him. So if we look at these, we'll see the burnt offering. The burnt offering was an animal put on the altar, and it was wholly burnt. It was completely consumed by the fire. And that offering was for God alone. There's something about what Christ has done, what Christ suffered on that cross, that we can't enter into. It's for the Father. We will never fully comprehend we will never fully enter in what it meant for Christ to die on that cross. We can't fully fathom the depth of what he went through when all sin, from Adam through to the final person that lives on this earth, all their sin, all that sin meant, placed upon him in judgment. That's a great mystery to us. We'll never understand it. So the burnt offering speaks of this offering made that is just alone for the Father. The Father can appreciate some things about the Son that we just are not able to enter into. And then there are other ones like the grain and meal offering. This is a gratitude offering. There are two aspects of offering. <coughs> One is a guilt offering because we're guilty and we need to be reconciled because of our guilt. And so a lot of the offerings of the Old Testament are dealing with our guilt because of sin. But there are gratitude offerings coming before God and just say, I'm thankful. Thank you, God, for doing this. A free will offering of gratitude. And so that's what the grain one was about. And that one, the priest could partake in that one. And the uh, peace offering as well is a gratitude offering. 
something that you give to God because you're grateful, you're thankful. It speaks of Christ restoring fellowship that has been broken. And the priest could enjoy this. And this is the only one, the peace offering, the only one that the general people could participate in. This is kind of why I want to show you this slide. That as the people of God, the Jewish people, there's only one of them that they were allowed to partake part of the offering. They could sit down and have fellowship, as it were, with the Lord at a place just by the door of the tabernacle, and they would eat part of that offering. In a sense to say, I'm having fellowship with God, and God is willing to have fellowship with man there. So that was a wonderful thing to offer to God, and God would receive it, and he would allow all the nation, all the people to offer that kind of offering and have fellowship together. And of course, the sin offering, the sin offering speak of Christ's judgment on the cross for our sins. And this one, again, the priest can partake in that one. There's parts of the sin offering that are for God, and there are parts of the sin offering that were for the priest. We both participate in what Christ did on the cross. There's some benefit to the believer, and there's some benefit to God. Everybody's enjoying this offering together. And that's a guilt offering because of sin. Because of sin, we need to have an offering to God. And of course, the only suitable offering to God is Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died on the cross for our sins. The trespass offering, very similar. The priest could partake of it. But you will notice that only the priest, and in one case, any of the people could participate. So when it comes to offering and worship, we as Christians living in this era, in this day of grace, have the greatest privilege of all, above all the Jewish community, because we're allowed to enter into the holy place, the most holy place. When the veil was rent in two, Christ made a way open for us to come into the very presence of God, because our guilt has been dealt with fully, completely by Christ. He paid the penalty, and through his blood we have access into the holy place. We are accepted in all our brokenness, in all of our sin, we are accepted as sons in the presence of God and welcome there to have fellowship with God. It's an amazing thing. And we should lift our heart in grateful praise to God. And then um, the, um, the guilt has been dealt with by Christ. And he's made that way open. And now we have free access. Only the high priest once a year was allowed to enter that place and not without blood. But Christ has shed his blood, and he's made the way open. And all these offerings are pointed to the fact that God wants to fellowship with man. He wants us to come together, come near. And the way we approach God is with an offering. It's the only appropriate way to approach God is with an offering. Sometimes when you go visit somebody's house, and uh, you're, you're a visitor, what do you do? Quite often we think it's polite to bring a little gift. Is it not so? When we visit people's house, we like to buy a little flower or card or something to just say, thank you for having us. We appreciate that. We just want to bind that relationship together. But we're not trying to take advantage of you. If you come to our house, we'll gladly receive you as well. But we're glad you did. And we want to show our unity, our fellowship together. So we express that way in just a small token, uh, some gift of some kind. And the person goes, oh, thank you. That's very nice. I appreciate that. And uh, God's the same way with us. He wants us to come before him with offering. It's the way we should approach God. And so this is what we do um, when we gather in his name. So our sacrifices are to do with gratitude and guilt. That's what we learn from Leviticus. All the offerings are about guilt and gratitude. And our guilt has been dealt with so we can come before him with gratitude. We no longer have to offer guilt offerings because that's been offered. Once for all, the one sacrifice of Christ has paid the debt of sin. That no longer <coughs> takes place. So, what is that? Oh my goodness, that one had music to it. <laughs> Did you hear that? I don't know what happened. This machine is just taken over. <laughs> so, the acceptable sacrifice is one thing to notice, and this is going to be an important point. When we come to God and we make our offerings, we have to make sure that they are representative of who he is and his holiness. When we look at Leviticus, we recognize that God had said certain things were to be done. 
certain types of animals, domestic animals. Um, there's certain unclean animals that would never be offered, but there were clean animals, certain types of animals be offered. And if you read Leviticus, you'll see that it goes into great detail about exactly all the body parts are listed as to what goes on the altar, what's for the priest, what's to be taken out and burned outside the camp. All those details are given to us because God cares infinitely about the representation of his son. Every offering says something about Christ. And so we want to be very careful how we offer. We can't just come into the presence of God anyhow, with any way or anything we want to do. Worship of God is a holy thing. It is something so sacred to the heart of God that if you come in with strange fire, be careful. When they were doing worship at the Lord's Supper, the Corinthians, some of them fell sick. Some of them even died because they weren't respecting the approach to God. And Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, they offered strange fire and fire came down from heaven and consumed them immediately. That made them quite fearful, right? Aaron was told not to mourn because he's wearing the royal robes. It was a very serious and solemn thing to enter the presence of God because what we must always recognize is that God is holy. God is transcendent. He's far above us, and we are just weak, beggarly sinners. But he does invite us to come. And in the right way, we may come. And the access we have by his grace is through Jesus Christ. Through him, we are accepted. He is the acceptable sacrifice. So we read in Malachi that they were offering lame and blind sacrifices. And God said, you wouldn't offer this to your governor. Why are you offering it to me? In fact, he says he would rather they close the doors of the temple. I close the door. Don't offer me this. Don't offer me this. Now we think about our own offerings to God. Let's be careful that our offerings are consistent with who God is. We don't give him our lame effort. We don't give him our unprepared, unthought through offering. We have a privilege to enter the presence of God, but we must do solemnly, remembering he is holy. And not everything is acceptable in God's presence. If it's representative of his son, he will be glad to receive it. Now we want to talk about our sacrifices. We don't take lambs and put them on an altar anymore. That system of sacrifice was done when Christ died. He is the true lamb of God. And all that the Levitical offerings were pointing forward to was Christ dying on the cross for our sins. That's never to be repeated. <coughs> and unfortunately, our Catholic friends believe that they re-sacrifice Christ in every Mass, which is contrary to what Scripture teaches us. He is sanctified forever, or he's, he's cleansed us forever through that sacrifice. It says in Hebrews 10, 14, I think it is. So we no longer need to make that guilt offering. We no longer need to make animal sacrifice, no longer blood sacrifice. If we were to do that, in Hebrews it talks about the Jewish people going back to that Judaistic system, and it says you trample underfoot the Son of God, and count the blood of the covenant is a common thing, uh, or an unholy thing, because they haven't seen the great value of Christ. Christ is the one offering that God accepts. All the other blood of bulls and goats, all that was only pointing to him. And they only have meaning as much as it points to him. So anything that we offer to God should never be something detracts from the truth that Christ is the only acceptable offering. So when we come before God in his presence, what we should be offering is his son. Lord, we present to you your son. He is the one in whom you find all your delight. We're not presenting ourselves because we're unrighteous, we're unholy, we're presenting Christ. He is the great offering. But there are other ways in which we may worship God Acceptable sacrifice. I've noticed this, that the sacrifice that we offer, notice this, is by him, of him, for him, and to him. It's all about him, isn't it? All the sacrifice. When you read these verses in 1 Peter, 5, or 1 Peter 2, 5, and Hebrews 13, 10, and it's talking about believers making sacrifice, it's always about him, for him, to him, by him. It's all to do with him. So we have to be careful to get ourselves out of that and make sure he's in it.
that worship is all about the Lord Jesus. Now, the privilege to participate. Thank you, dear. God bless you. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it in a holy place. It shall be eaten in the court of the temple or tent of meeting. We have a privilege to participate in what God has done. The Lord's Supper, I think, is our way of participating in the great sacrifice of Christ. He said, do this in remembrance of me. That's the only prescribed meeting for Christians in the New Testament. Everything else they did because the Holy Spirit drew them together for the apostles' doctrine, prayer, whatever. But Paul waited in Troas seven days to meet with the believers for to break bread. That was why he did wait for that. That's the central meaning of the church. That is center to our Christian lives. And it's center to everything that matters to God because it's concerning his son. Remember me, he said. Remember me. Now, I'm not saying that we have to do certain things a certain way. We need to remember him. That's what we need to do. We need to remember him. Now, how long that meeting is, whether it's on Sunday morning, Sunday, those are all little issues that we have to work out because Scripture doesn't describe to us. But if we have the heart and mind of Christ, we will recognize its importance to the heart of God. And we will make sure that we come prepared to do what he asked us to do. And it seems to me when he asks us to remember his death, his blood and his body sacrificed for us, the only reasonable response to that is an overflow of worship. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Praise him. You know, and this is one of the sacrifices we offer to him. So the Lord's Supper is important. And just a, a little word of um, counsel on that. Um, well, we'll get to that in a minute because I have another slide on it. But I want to talk about our participation in the Lord's Supper. Um, here the verse is, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. That's Hebrews 13. Now, in this context, he's talking about Jewish people who uh, belong to the old sacrificial system. They haven't recognized their Messiah. They haven't acknowledged that his death was for their sin. And all the typology is now done away with because Christ has come and paid the price for sin. And he says they don't have a right to participate in this altar. See, you and I have that privilege. All the other religion, all the other uh, beliefs of men count for nothing in God's sight except for us who know him and love him can come and make the acceptable sacrifice. We have an altar, and others cannot participate in that altar. You have to be a believer. You have to know the Lord Jesus. You have to be cleansed by the blood. If you're not cleansed in the blood and you try to approach God's presence, you might end up like Nadab and Abihu, which is a very scary thing, isn't it? We want to be careful that we allow believers to remember the Lord, to enter into his presence. Because it's all about those who have been washed in the blood, who are now can are qualified to enter God's presence and present their offerings to God. Now, the next thing that Peter will teach us about our role as priests, we're all priests before God. And we've been given the privilege of being a holy priest and a royal priest. Now, a royal priest is a representative of God. A royal priest is somebody who goes forth and declares the praises of him who called us out of darkness into marvelous light. Right? That's our job as Christians, to go into the world and speak well of Christ. This is what Christ has done, to show his praises to the world. But the holy priest comes into the very presence of God, and he worships God. He speaks to the heart of God. And that is to um, the, the holy priest. He says, you offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Notice the direction there. It's toward God. One ministry of the priest is toward the house, toward the people. Another ministry of the priest is toward God, ministry in the heart of God. You know, it says in Acts 13 that Paul and the others... We're meeting and praying together and fasting, and they were ministering to the Lord. Ministering to the Lord. Right now I'm ministering to you. But when I go on my knees and I pray, I'm ministering to the Lord. When we offer our sacrifices, remember this about the Lord's Supper. This is the point I was trying to get to. 
the Lord's Supper, we're to minister to the heart of God. We're to enter the presence of God. It seems to me a bit of a shame that we come in and we look at one another and start ministering to one another when we know we're here to worship God. We're here to turn toward God and say, God, I, I thank you for your son. Thank you for what he did on the cross. We take our heart toward God and we tell him what we think of his son. We offer up sacrifices of praise in the presence of God. There's a time and a place to minister to the house of God. That's also the work of a priest. But the Lord's Supper, I think, should be sanctified for this purpose, to minister to the heart of God, to turn our heart toward the Lord. I think that's what God intended. I can't, other than Peter's uh, delineation between the two roles of the priesthood, I can't give you much more than that. But I think if you discern that from Scripture, you will see that this is pleasing to God. This is what he wants in his presence, to speak well of his son, to come into his presence. And I think it's wonderful to hear a brother get up and uh, rather than read the scripture to everybody, but he speaks directly to God and he pours on his heart in adoring worship of the son of God. We're all blessed by that, but how much more the father is blessed in our presence. It's like this. If you invited somebody to a birthday party, let's say it was Clayton's birthday, you turned 50 years old. I don't know how old you are, but maybe around there. Are you 49? Okay. Oh, I was close. <laughs> Let's say we all went to a birthday party for Clayton. And uh, Brother Lawrence got up and said, Well, Daniel, it's nice to have you here. I'm so glad you made it. And all his attention was on me, not on Clayton. But the birthday party is for Clayton. It's to celebrate him. It's his birthday. We would feel like, well, there's something missing there. We, we missed the mark a bit, right? And this is somehow what we do at the Lord's Supper. We focus on one another rather than the one who should be the focus, our Lord Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me. It's all about him. So that's what we need to do in our offerings. And then, um, oh, wow, I don't know what's going on there. So what's our acceptable uh, sacrifice? You know, it's interesting. When they brought their sacrifice to the door of the tabernacle it says in leviticus chapter 1 verse 3 uh, his offering is a burnt offering the herd he shall bring a male without blemish he shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting and notice this that he may be accepted before the lord not the animal the worshiper is accepted he has to bring the right offering but his acceptance is based on the offering or on like, what he's brought like the offering is acceptable then he's accepted now, what's your and I acceptance into the presence of God? It is in Him that we are accepted, right? We're made accepted in the Beloved. The reason you and I can stand in God's presence at all is because of Him. Because we're covered in His blood. We represent Him. We're in Him. And so we're accepted on that basis alone. And that makes our sacrifices acceptable to God. So He accepts us. And He can accept our offerings of praise or worship based on the fact that we belong to Him. So we are accepted, not just our offerings, but we are accepted. And that's important because the offerings, our worship of God, as I said at the beginning, is about drawing near and having fellowship with God, coming into God's presence, and he will accept us. You remember, um, you remember when Jesus was invited into the home of Simon, the Pharisee? You see, Simon invited him into his home, and put a meal before him. And in some sense, you might say he accepted him into his home. But he didn't really accept him into his heart, did he? Because Jesus said, look, I came to your home and you didn't kiss me, didn't anoint my head with oil, didn't wash my feet, which are customs that you would normally do. And that woman that came in, uninvited guest, she kissed his feet. She took perfume anointed his feet and took the glory of her hair and wiped his feet. Was she receiving him? Absolutely. She received him that day, but Simon didn't, even though he was eating Simon's food. Simon was ready to judge him and say, if you knew what kind of woman this was, you, you wouldn't let her touch you. You see the difference there? It has to do with the heart, doesn't it? When we offer our offerings to God, it's not that little thing that we're offering, it's our heart. That's what he wants. Do I love him? Do I care about him? Am I saying these words because they're heartfelt 
true feelings of my heart, that I'm really grateful for what he's done for me. That's what God's looking for. He's not looking for eloquence. Not looking for that I can quote all these scriptures on the top of my head. Not looking for you know some kind of flowery language of some kind. No. He's looking for my heart, sincerity of my heart. If we really understand that, we've got to wash away anything that's phony, anything that's not real to who we are, because God wants to have intimate relationship with our heart. And when we come into his presence, we can offer him something that's sweet and fragrant, that speaks truly of a heart's gratitude. That is something that we can give to God that he wouldn't otherwise get. It's the gratitude of our heart, the true praise from our lips. He's not going to force that from us. He deserves it. We ought to give it to him. And when we freely give it to him, it delights his heart. If it's sincere, if it's true. So what are our offerings? What do we offer to God? Well, Romans says we offer our bodies. We can offer that as a sacrifice to God. That means my whole life is given over to God. Not that I lay on the altar and, and suffer and die. Jesus did that for me. Some people do give their life in the cause of Christ, but not a martyr without reason. They've, they've obviously gone out to preach the gospel in hostile places, and they get martyred like, like these people in Ecuador did in 1956, I think it was. So we give our body, but our body as a living sacrifice. Lord, my life is dedicated to you and your purposes. And that's a huge thing, isn't it? When we dedicate all of ourselves to him. Our praise, Hebrew says, and praise here is a sacrifice. Now, you think about that. Why is my praise a sacrifice? If I say, well, Lord, I, I praise you because you, you uh, saved my soul. That doesn't seem to cost very much. But sometimes praise is a costly thing. Because when we stand for Christ in a hostile world and we uphold that name, sometimes we do suffer, don't we? We can be ridiculed. We can be persecuted. In Canada now, you can be jailed just for saying what the Bible says. And so are we willing to take a stand and really honor his name? Because praise has to do with anything that we can do to uphold his name and glorify him in a culture that hates him. And so sometimes that may be a costly thing to do. To get up in the assembly and share a couple thoughts is not a very costly thing to do. But if you spend all your week with the Lord, meditating on him, enjoying him, and walking with him, and then your heart overflows on Sunday morning with worship, that's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice of praise, isn't it? <coughs> but if we've never spent any time or watching football on the TV all week, and we, we presume that we can get up and worship God. That's not much of a sacrifice. And be careful not to bring the lame, the blind, bring something of that has cost us something. You know, like, like David said, shall I offer to the Lord that which cost me nothing? We, we, we don't make it something of value through the cost. Our thanks, also in Hebrews um, 13, 15, Christians should be the most thankful people on earth, right? We should always be giving thanks. I think we do. I think we do. I think we are grateful people. There's a lot of people going around grumbling and complaining. Grumbling and complaining is the opposite of gratitude, isn't it? We're not thankful. We just see the fault and want to complain. But a truly humble person who is thankful, truly thankful, we won't hear them complain very much. They'll be very grateful for everything that God has done and given and provided, even when they suffer. You know, my daughter, Amy, she lives in Norman Wells. She just moved from her house. She lived in a tiny little, rough little apartment, stinky little place. It was there for two years they were there, and, and they endured it. It was pretty rough. But they finally got another home, a decent home, three bedrooms, so the kids have their own place. And she took the kids over to clean up the place, wash up the place. And uh, she was showing me in video how rough the place looked, even after she cleaned it. And she said to the kids, you know, it's not a very nice place, but God gave us a roof over our heads. So let's thank her. Pray for Amy. She needs your prayers. But God appreciates when we're thankful. Appreciates when we're thankful. 
because everything we have comes from him. And, and I think one of the most distasteful things is a, a lack of gratitude. You do everything for your children, and all they do is they're spoiled and demand more and complain it's not enough. That doesn't do anything for our heart. But as soon as that little child says, thank you, Mommy, thank you, Daddy, our hearts just lift up with joy. Gratitude means a lot to God, and we ought to be willing to make that sacrifice too. And we can give him our possessions. This is well-pleasing to God. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. When we communicate or we do good to others, uh, mostly to the household of faith, we should always care about God's people. But we should be people who are known to do good, to take what God has put into our hands, our resources, and be able to bless others with that. That really speaks of the heart of God. God is good. He's generous. He cares for everybody all over the globe. Whether they love him or not, he feeds them and cares for them. And as Christians, we need to be less occupied with our own needs and more occupied with the needs of others around us. And as we share and give, and I can say from my own experience, what I've learned is this, the more that God has challenged me or taught me to be generous and give and share with the needs of others, and Africa teach me a lot about that, the more God smiles upon me because he's pleased. That's, that's the heart of God, to just do good. It says of Jesus, he went about doing good. And so we should be characterized by that as well. That's one offering we give to him. And, of course, our proclamation, he talks about in 1 Peter 2, 9, we proclaim the excellencies of him who's called us out of darkness into marvelous light. We have a gospel to share. That's our offering. That's what we can do for God. God, you saved my soul. You rescued me from the fire. Now I want to take that great message of salvation and I want to spread it abroad. And in doing that, we make an offering to God. Uh, we, we let him know that his purpose, his love, means enough to me that I'm willing to sacrifice all my energy and time to make sure others hear that message. So these are ways in which we worship God. When we come on Sunday morning, it's not a trivial matter. It is the most precious thing to the heart of God when we present his son back to him and tell him what we think of him. As feeble as our thoughts are, as frail as our Christian lives can be, when we speak of him and we do so with reverence and truth in our heart, it delights the heart of the Father. We have a great privilege in the assembly. The assembly is to be a place of worship. When people come in, I remember... First times people come in and see the Lord's Supper in some places, and they're like, wow, I've never seen anything like that. A lot of churches are characterized by noise and all kinds of stuff going on, flashy stuff. But when people see true worship, people whose heart is connected to God and grateful in his presence, that moves people because they don't often see it. They don't often see it. Let's let them see in us that the church is an altar. And we are willing to demonstrate our heart before God in worship. Well, I think we're done. That's our conference. <laughs> We've learned about the assembly. Assembly is a testimony. Assembly is a school. Assembly is a hospital. And the assembly is an altar, a place of worship. Well, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for these time we spent together. To consider your words, we pray that it will affect us. We will understand our part and purpose in the assembly of your people. You gather us together for a purpose, to be a testimony, a testimony to the world, to shine our light so others can see Christ. We're also a school where we're supposed to be learning, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. So help us to be better students, to study your word, to show ourselves approved unto God. And Father, we pray, too, that we will be uh, true to your heart in caring for the broken and the hurting, those who need a healing touch. Help us to draw alongside and offer that which will bring your love and care and healing hand to the needy all around us. People are hurting every day, and sometimes we're not even aware of their pain and their hurt. Father, we pray, too, above all, the thing which you care about most, what you have sacrificed the most for, is that we might enter into your presence and know that intimate contact with our God in the courts of worship. 
Father, you procured this through the blood of your Son. We thank you for him and giving us access through him. We pray that we will tread carefully, wisely, as we enter your presence, that we might offer acceptable sacrifices that are well-pleasing in your sight. Teach us to be worshipers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. That was, that was really wonderful. I'm late. I have to run from anywhere.